Hi there, I'm Phil. I'm the head of strategy at Foolproof, which is an experienced design agency based in London. And we are uh, sponsoring the bar, which is a very important fact. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, is Raphael still here? No? Great. Does anyone have my one? Because I need a drink after this, so if you find it, let me know. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about how startups have changed the UK banking market in the last four years. Um, I do lots of things these days, but my background is in design research, so I've done about one to 2,000 hours of customer interviews trying to understand how to make better products and services for people. And I've worked with most of the major banks in the UK and a number of fintech startups. But if you live in the UK, you don't have to work in the industry to have noticed that in the last four years, our banking market has changed completely. It's been revolutionized by startup banks such as Starling and Monzo and a few others. And these startups are much more design-led, they're much more customer-centric than the traditional banks that have gone before them. In the UK, it's gone from a situation where people think banks are all the same and your banking app is mediocre at best to a situation where you could legitimately say that your banking app is the best, best app on your phone and that your bank is you know, one of the best examples of how to run a company and how to create great design, which I know sounds a bit unbelievable, but, it, but it's true. We're now in a situation where the best bank in the UK did not exist five years ago. This is a table from which it's an organization similar to Consumer Reports or JD Power in the US, and they rate Monzo as the best bank in the UK. LinkedIn's top startups, uh, 10 of the top 15 are in fintech, and three of the top four are apps that you can essentially use as your day-to-day -day bank. And these new banks are growing really quickly. So this is the number of users Monzo has. They've just passed three million, and the last million came in the last four months. Now 57% of these customers are daily active users. So they're not just signing up and forgetting about it, they're, they're using it. Just for context, there's about 52 million people, a million adults in the UK, so about 6% of the population has a Monzo account, even though most people have not even heard of Monzo yet. So how did we get to this point? Like, how, how did this happen? I'm gonna to talk today about uh, why those new banks exist in the first place, what approaches they've taken and what was successful, and then how they've used design to create an advantage which is sustainable. So first of all, wh why are these new banks even, even here? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, a change in regulation made it easier to start a new bank. And secondly, the state of the experiences that did exist was not very good. So when new banks appeared, there was a kind of a clear gap in the market for them to fill. So first one, I know I've been waiting all day to hear about regulation changes. Um, OK, so five years ago, this is what the UK banking market looked like. So there's five banks controlling 85% of all the accounts. Uh, so it's a very established, very static market. And to give you a sense of this, you know, these are institutions. Like three of the top five are older than America. So things don't change like very often. So there was a new bank in 2010, the first new bank in over 100 years. Like this is, this sounds crazy. But this is how hard it is to start a new bank in the UK. Um, but that all changed with the financial crisis, right? Uh, I, could, I was thinking of putting like, other pictures in here, but this is uh, pretty tame. Um, so this, this changed everything. And one thing that the UK government decided to do is they, they figured out, OK, we need to change how the industry is regulated. So they decided to create a new a financial regulator called the FCA. And this new regulator, they, as part of their mandate, uh, they decided to promote competition. And the way they did this 
was by changing the rules for starting a new bank. So they, they reduce the barriers to entry. So you don't need as much money to start a bank. Uh, the process is easier, these kinds of things. I know these kind of screenshots of press releases are kind of boring, but without this change, we would have a banking industry that looks fairly similar to what it did five years ago, and I wouldn't really have much to talk about. So although it's uh, regulation and that's, that's that, uh, this is really important. So today we have um, a whole lot more competition in our marketplace. These are the most notable um, startups in the UK. So there's a kind of an explosion of them. These are just kind of five of, of dozens. So you've got Monzo and Starling. These are fully licensed banks. They have the same sort of regulation standards as HSBC and Lloyds and anyone else. And they have a, a decent amount of customers. You've got Revolut and Moneys. These are, they, they don't have a banking license, so your money isn't protected like it is in another bank, but you can more or less use them as your day-to-day -day bank account. And then N26, this is kind of fully licensed German bank, um, and they're expanding into the UK and the US as well. So those banks have been able to now emerge because of those changes, but like, why would there be a gap in the market? Well, the simple answer is that uh, the banks that were already there weren't doing a very good job of serving customers. So five years ago, we, you know, we do lots of research at Foolproof, and one of the things we heard again and again in research was that banks are all the same. Like we'd hear this all the time from, from customers. And I think it's kind of easy to to sort of say, well, they're not experts in banking, right? They're not like us. So, of course, they're not going to think um, that there are differences. Like, you know, maybe they just don't know. But actually, they, they're not idiots, right? They were correct. It did feel like all the banks were the same. And I think the best way to look at this, um, oh, sorry, the, the, the reason why they thought this was that essentially big banks have been promising one thing and delivering another. So one way to look at this is if you compare the advertising for a bank and then you compare the experience, you often find quite big differences. So let's have, let's have a look at a few examples of banks in the UK and what their experience is like. So Santander, they are all about their celebrity endorsements. So there's a, a Formula One driver here. We've got Star Wars. And they're saying, we're here to help you prosper. But in the app, it like, it's kind of generic. Like, it doesn't really look like they're here to help you prosper. Like, maybe a bit like, here's your cash back you've earned. That's pretty much it. Barclays, let's go forward. Uh, they have campaigns about digital skills and life skills. But the app is kind of similar to other apps. Like, it doesn't really come through. Metro Bank. So this was the first bank in 100 years. And they're saying, join the revolution a fresh start to banking, it's banking but it's better. But this app, like, is, it kind of looks like really, really similar to, to other, like you could just change the color blue and it'd be basically the same. So you can't blame people for thinking banks are all the same, like what is the point of switching? And there was a, a slide earlier where someone was talking about switching fees, like it costs you money to switch from one bank to another. In the UK, it is very, very easy to, to switch your bank. There's a kind of industry-wide service called seven-day switching. So you just ask your new bank, switch me over, here's my existing details. They do it all for free. It's you know, nothing, it's like very low risk, so it's very easy to do. But no one was doing it because they just think all the banks are the same. What, like, what's the point? Even if you give me 100 pounds to switch, like, is it really worth it? Sometimes even the advertising is the same. So <laughs> like children with, superhero outfits, like I don't know why this is such a thing, but again, like all the banks feel like they're the same. It doesn't ma matter what, really what they're saying, it, it all just seems very sort of mediocre. So this, this kind of difference between what they're saying and what they're doing is what we call the brand experience gap. And it's really talking about the important link between what people expect because of what you're telling them and what they 
what they experience, you know, what actually happens. So a good example of this is a famous American invention. So let's imagine that uh, you're promising this, okay, but if you just deliver this, <laughs> what people think of you is this, right? It doesn't matter what you say in your marketing or your advertising. If you're delivering a poor experience, that's what people think of you. And this was what was happening in the UK market. Loads and loads of money spent on advertising, but the experience wasn't very good. So when people were saying banks are all the same, what they were really saying is that this is what the, the banking market looks like. Like it's all the same and it's all kind of crappy. Um, so when, when some new startups came along and they, they said they were going to be different and they were different, then it was such a stark con contrast between what people have been uh, kind of seeing for the last 10 years. So, you know, I've picked Monzo here, but I could kind of pick anyone. They've just got a nice character. But this is, this is what it felt like. And so there was a lot of excitement in the UK when these new startups came about and they were just very, very different to what had come before. So that's kind of why they exist now and um, why they, they're kind of, there was a gap in the market for them to fill. I'm going to talk to you now about five ways that they've become successful because it's kind of one thing to have an opportunity, it's another thing to kind of take that opportunity and make the most of it. This, you can, you can read it on my version of the slides. So. Okay, so one of the things that um, these startups did is they started with problems that other people were ignoring. So imagine you're creating a new bank from scratch. One of the things you're probably going to think is like, okay, if we need to create a new bank, what are all the things we need to make? If you look at any existing bank, like there's a lot of stuff you, you need to have, right? You need to have mortgages, you need to have credit cards, you need to have checks if you're here, and you need to have uh, a way for people to call you and you know, reset their PIN number and all this kind of stuff. So if you're a new bank, where do you even start? It's very overwhelming, it feels insurmountable. But what these successful startups have done is they've just realized like we don't have to do everything let's either target audiences that other people are ignoring, or let's target the parts of the experience which uh, are generally bad. There's, there's lots of parts of a banking experience where they just always get deprioritized, or they are deemed too trivial to be put onto the roadmap or done like next. And so some of these startups have um, picked off uh, these, these kind of parts of the experience. So a few examples. So TransferWise, they have um, a borderless account, which means that you can have currencies in uh, multiple currencies in one account. You can also have uh, your account details kind of in the US and the UK and the, and the EU. So you can have one account and get paid from kind of any of those places. You don't have to mess around with multiple bank accounts in multiple countries. So this doesn't do everything, but if you're the type of person who moves between countries, Maybe you like live in, live in London and work in New York or something like that. Like this is perfect. Revolut, uh, similar thing. So they started by targeting um, foreign exchange fees on purchases and transfers. So they're saying we're not about hidden fees or rubbish exchange rates. That's why people use Revolut. Monies, so the founder of this bank he moved from Estonia to London and he couldn't open a bank account because he didn't have any credit history. So he started this bank uh, serving migrants and other people like himself. Free trade, this is not a bank. Uh, this is kind of similar to Robin Hood in the US. So it's kind of targeting the fees that uh, banks charge you when you want to trade shares. Again, like very high normally, like 12 pounds whereas these guys are doing it for free. So again, like, there's lots of things this service does not do. Um, it only has about 500 shares on there, so it doesn't have the whole market. But what it does, it does really, really well. So these are all examples of um, kind of companies that are doing a few things 10 times better. And because they're doing that, people will kind of forgive them for not doing everything else. The best example of this is Monzo. And I'll use Monzo as an example a lot. 
and I won't apologize for it because it's the best example of, of all this stuff. So when Monzo launched, um, it was a very simple product. It was essentially a card that you could load money onto and then you could spend it. But you couldn't pay anyone else, you couldn't pay any bills, you couldn't uh, pay in cash or checks, you couldn't use Google or Apple Pay, there was no joint accounts, no um, deposit protection. I could go on. Like It, it was a really, very really simple product. Um, so, you, so you just couldn't use it as your main bank account. But there were lots of things this did which were kind of 10 times better than the status quo. So for example, um, when you got a new card, a bank would send you the PIN number in the mail and three days later you get it. Whereas Monzo, they just text you the number and you get it like seconds later. When you make a transaction, you get a notification immediately. It tells you how much you're spending instead of that transaction appearing three days later in your account. Every transaction is automatically categorized. You can add a note, add a receipt, you can see a map. This kind of stuff is now fairly standard, but three or four years ago, this was so different to what uh, any kind of traditional bank's app was like. You can search uh, for your transactions. So you can say, you know, groceries last month or transactions over 20 pounds. It would just show this stuff. You can freeze and freeze your card instantly rather than calling up the call center. You can have a little graph of your balance. So these are all things they had just at launch, let alone all the stuff they have now. So this kind of really shows that you know, you, if you find the parts of the experience that are really subpar, or you find the audiences that are being continually forgotten, then there's lots and lots of um, kind of opportunity to, to kind of create great products and services. So that's one thing they did. The second thing they did is to align their goals with customer goals. So it's not unreasonable for people to be skeptical about the banking industry based on recent history. And I think if you can show that you're different, um, then, then there's a kind of a lot of benefit from that. So essentially, if you can um, align what you want, your business objectives, with what customers want, then there's a huge amount of kind of profit from that. One example uh, from Monzo. So when they uh, were in their first year, they were losing a lot of money per customer. So they were losing about 65 pounds per customer per, per year, mainly um, like card fees and ATM fees. Um, they weren't, you know, they don't charge customers for, for lots of things. They were kind of absorbing the cost themselves. So they needed to stop making a loss on each additional customer. And of course they could cut costs, but they also needed to increase their revenue. Now one way of increasing your re revenue is to get the interchange fees higher. So basically get people to make more transactions. And one way of doing that is to get people to put their salary into the account. So if they put their salary into the account, then they'll be using it more, and then you'll get more revenue. So if you just had these objectives, and you didn't pay attention to what customers want, like you, you could come up with some stuff, but it might not be very ethical or, or very good. So instead, let's have a look at what customers want. So most customers in the UK are paid once a month, and it's really difficult to manage your money. So people often end up using a credit card or using an overdraft, he says, um, yeah, because, they're, because they're running out of money. So people can't wait till payday. So one of the things that Monzo did is they introduced this feature where you can get paid a day early. So they had already had this feature whereby you could see your salary coming in the next day because um, you know, when the employer does their payroll, the payment goes to the bank, the bank can kind of see it's already there. So they're already showing you, like tomorrow you will get paid by foolproof this much money. Um, then they added this uh, feature where you could just take that money a day early for free because I suppose they realized that 99% of the time like that money comes in anyway. Of course there's a catch where if the money doesn't really come in and you're defrauding us somehow, then we're gonna take the money back. But other than that, you can have this money for free. And when you do this, you kind of like use your thumb to like pull the money into the wallet. Um, and then it like bursts through and, and breaks the presentation. So um, that's a nice little thing. And 
I think this is a great example where there's a nice match between the business goals because only customers who put their salary into the account can use this feature, so therefore will increase revenue. And for customers, because like who doesn't want to get paid a day early for free? And this is a kind of idea where this is not enabled by some new magical technology that other banks could not have used or, or done. Like this has been the case for years. So it's just about having the right mindset to kind of find these kind of problems. Okay. I think if you're starting a new bank and you're trying to be different, it's very tempting to design the experience to be different. Like we're different, it should, should feel different. So you can, you can do something like this. So this is Atom Bank. Uh, this was the first startup in the UK to get a banking license. They had the first mover advantage. And this is what their app looked like when they launched. Um, it doesn't look like any app or any banking app like ever seen before. It looks more like a game. You kind of use these bubbles to kind of scroll through the months. And it's very, very, very confusing. So when this came out, you know, people are trying to get used to the idea of banking with a company that's not a recognizable brand and also trying to learn this new way of, of using an app. So they, they have not been as successful as some of the other banks that, you know, uh, sort of came second or third. Um, and I think one of the main reasons is because of the way they've kind of designed it to be too different from uh, the norm. Some of the more successful ones, uh, like Starling, they look more like a banking experience or they look more like another app that you've used. So they're kind of building on the conventions of um, other digital experiences people have used and they've been a lot more successful. Uh, monies, I think these guys are using color really well. So in most traditional banks, their brand guidelines or their style guide, um, the colors in them they were designed for print, so if it's a red bank, you usually get red, black, white, maybe gray, like that's all you get. And any designer will tell you like that's a nightmare. Like, as, as soon as I have to do a, a donut chart, like the whole, thing, the whole thing breaks. So these guys like starting as a more modern startup, they are using color in a much more effective way to denote meaning. It looks friendlier, but, but again, it's like not so far removed from banking apps that people have experienced before. So yeah, the, the most successful ones we've seen, they are familiar enough to be comfortable, like you feel okay putting your money uh, with these apps, but they're different enough in important ways to be better. One, one of the kind of big differences between the startups that have succeeded and the ones that have not is um, about the environment that people are creating uh, the experiences in. And we've heard lots of talks today about how important like the team is and, and all that kind of stuff. And this is really about the same thing. So as designers, we know that people's behavior is shaped by their environment. And my favorite example of this is everyone's favorite Swedish home furniture store. Uh, so if you go to Ikea and imagine you're there as like a, a researcher and you're just there to observe people, what you'll see is two sets of very different behavior. So if you go to Ikea and you go upstairs in the showroom, uh, you'll see people just kind of aimlessly wandering around and they're not very decisive and they're just kind of bickering and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and then you go downstairs and people are like hyper-focused and they're only interested in like a few things. They just want to get in and get out. And so we know like how IKEA works, so it makes sense. Um, but I just think it's a really good example of how the different environment can shape people's behavior. Of course, in companies, like this is the kind of stuff that makes up the environment. And we've heard about some of these things today. And in general, in most tr traditional banks, the environment has not been conducive to creating great design, great experiences. If you work in a place where you do not have the right tools, like you have some old laptop with Lotus Notes, and you don't have Wi-Fi, and there's lots of politics, and there's lots of silos, and it takes three weeks to find out about something you know, that happened in a previous project, and you can't talk to customers, 
and et cetera, et cetera. If you've got all these barriers, like how could you possibly create a better experience? It doesn't matter if you know how to do it. Like if you can't make it happen, it's just really, really difficult. Whereas in a lot of these new startups, the most successful ones, the environment is very, very different. Now, of course, it's easier if you're a small company, but there's lots of things they're doing, for example, here with Monzo again, tr default to transparency. Like, that's a very, very different way of working than in many big companies where there's lots of kind of fiefdoms and just finding out things can take a long time. So having a different environment um, gives you different results. One of the best examples of this is a feature that, that Monzo added uh, last year. So you can now see a bill uh, coming out of your account up to three days in advance. So if my water bill's coming out, I can see how much it's going to be, and I can make sure there's enough money in my account so that I don't go into my overdraft. And I asked the guy who made this, like the one guy who made it, and I said, how long did it take to build this? A week, about, about a week. Like in a big bank, that would take months if you ever got it on the roadmap, right? It, it's just so different. And it's not because this guy is like really, really, really smart. It's because the environment is different and he's able to do something different. So here's a, here's a thought experiment. Let's say we've got two teams. One is in the incumbent banking corporation of America. And we have a team in the sexy fintech startup. Like what if we took these two teams and we just swap them around. Like, what, what, what do we think would happen? I think that we would see that the environment is a lot more important than the innate skills and talents of the people. And okay, like both teams are gonna get some, take some time to sort of get up to speed in a new place to work. But we're gonna see that the, the FinTech team who've gone to the, the big corporate, suddenly they're much less productive because the environment is much less conducive to to doing great work. And the team from the corporate who have gone into the, the fintech startup, suddenly they're doing a lot more and they're creating great design work and they're much more productive because they, the environment uh, is allowing them to do that because they don't have the barriers that they've seen before. So, you know, Monzo are doing an amazing job, but it's not because those people are like really, really, really smart and talented, like they are, but that's not the only reason. Like the bigger banks have lots of very, very smart and talented people as well, but the people there just can't do their best work. So I think like some of the talks earlier, I'd reiterate, you, you have to design the environment as much as you're designing the, the interface as well. I mean, really, if you design the kind of environment, the interface and all that stuff will almost take care of itself. There's this, uh, this law I mean, it's a law, like someone said a thing and it becomes a law at some point. Uh, Conway's law, this is from the 60s. And this kind of captures this. So it says, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So it's saying, like, if you make a thing, it's going to reflect who you are. And so what this means is that the experience is only going to be as uh, good as the organization that makes it. It's, it's very, very difficult to make a joined up, coherent, world-class experience if you're working in a completely um, disjointed company that doesn't know what it's doing and doesn't give people the right tools and the right culture and all this kind of stuff. So really kind of making sure that, that your kind of teams have the right conditions is, is absolutely um, important. And I think this is one reason why if you don't change the, the environment, the bigger banks really struggle to catch up with the startups. Even though they have more money, like the money doesn't kind of buy you the success because if you're just throwing the money at a bad environment, like people can't change anything. Okay. And lastly, uh, engage your audience. So this is, a, again, like something where some startups have done it, done it really well and others have not done it well, but it makes a huge difference. So it, it's really easy to criticize most large companies um, for not listening to their customers. Like this is a common complaint you hear in research. And the general reason why this is the case is that 
most companies don't talk to their customers. Like they do research, which is great. I, I love research. They have like a voice of the customer survey and they maybe talk to customers in um, their branch or on the phone. But it's not a two-way conversation. Like they listen a bit, but then they don't share anything out. Like banks keep their uh, secrets kind of close to their chest. They don't tell anyone what they're doing. The only time you hear about what a big bank learned or what it did wrong is if it's done something very, very naughty and there's lots of politicians grilling a CEO about something terrible they've done. They don't actually share or have a proper conversation with their customers. It's about sort of gathering data to inform a decision. It's not about really having a conversation. So this is something that Monzo have done really, really well. And this is one of their secrets to their success and why they've grown so quickly. So when you go and uh, collect your card from Monzo, this is a photo when I got mine. When they launched, you had to go to their office and meet the staff to get your card. And they're rolling out in the US at the moment, and this is the same thing they're doing here. So you have to come to an event like this to get your card. So you're kind of forced to uh, go along and meet the bank staff. Do you know, I like the, the CTO uh, has some great socks here. Um, so he's telling us about you know, what's the vision for the bank and like what can you use this card for and what can you not use it for. So this kind of really from day one sets off this, this precedent of like we're having a conversation, like you're part of a community and they've continued this uh, ever since. So they have a monthly open office where any, anyone can come along and they present um, what they're working on, what their plans are. There's a Q&A. Um, and anyone can ask any question about you know, what they're doing. Like, can you imagine a traditional bank saying, yeah, we have the CEO, he'll do a talk and then uh, tell everyone what we're working on for the next six months and then he'll just receive questions from anyone without any warning and he'll answer them. Like, should we do that? Like, no one's, no one's gonna do that. So these guys, it's kind of from day one built into what they're doing. We're going to have this community and be really open about what we're doing and be really transparent. And you can, you can go and watch these online. Like when they moved into their new office, they created a dedicated space, a bit like this, where they can host a couple of hundred people, um, other community events. You can watch it on YouTube. You can stream it. So they're really kind of giving a lot of access to their customers and, and sort of sharing back with the people that the that are kind of giving them information in the first place. They put their roadmap online for the first few years. So if you're a product manager, like, you're probably having a heart attack seeing this. Um, like, no, no one does this. This is, this is mad, right? Uh, because what if you change it? Like, what if you put something on there and it doesn't happen? Like, that's okay. Because if you're a new bank and you've got to make all the stuff, uh, the, the experience when you launch is not going to have all the things in it. So what this allowed them to do is to say, okay, you know, everyone who's using it has a feature that it's not in there. So I want joint accounts. Like, where's joint account? I can see, like, okay, it's kind of come in, like, six months' time. And that's great because you need people to give you the benefit of the doubt, like, have faith that you will eventually get there. If you're not sharing anything with them and telling them that you're going to get there, like, will, it, you know, will a feature get there or not? Like, with a big bank, if you want something to change in the app, like, how you might moan on Twitter or you might email them, like, their, their help desk or something, and maybe that one person will reply back and say, oh, it's, it's, it's on our plans for the next year. But, like, you're the only person who saw that. No one else knows that. Um, and, you know, will it happen? Like, it's just a... A, a kind of a black box, um, what's happening in that company. Whereas with Monzo, you can kind of see what's happening. They have this forum online. There's half a million posts on here now. And now this is kind of like a, you know, over time, it's a, it's a smaller and smaller part of their customer base. Um, at the start, kind of everyone was on there. Now it's the kind of most geeky, enthusiastic people. Um, but on here, when they're working on something, the team at Monzo will post updates. So they've been redesigning their uh, navigation in the app. 
and there's one, um, there's one post on there with like 4,000 different replies where every single week they're releasing a new version of the app that you can opt in to use. And then, um, you know, people are commenting and providing feedback and they're answering questions. And none of this has to go through like a PR person. Like the teams just interact directly with customers. And, you know, now it's like 3 million customers. They're fully regulated bank. It's not just because they're a startup and they've got some like get out of free, get out of jail free card, they can just do it. Um, they're just a, a bank like anyone else. So yeah, this, this kind of makes a big difference. Even on uh, policy, they, they use this community. So they were absorbing a lot of fees for foreign ATM transactions. So if I use my Monzo card here, uh, Monzo pay like a five dollar fee and they absorb that like I don't pay anything but you can imagine like that adds up quite quickly and so they had um, they need to put some limits around it so they came up with three options and they said to the community like vote on which one you think is fairest and so five and a half thousand people voted 60% for this option and that's the option they went with now a traditional bank might do some pricing research like you can survey 5,000 people like very easily, but it takes some balls to put it on the website so everyone can see what the result was because in a big bank, like you could say, well, that's nice, but like actually number two, we, we really wanted number two to be the one. Whereas if you're being open and transparent and imagine if they went with the second one, like what would people think of them? You know, you're not really living up to what you're doing. So yeah, th this stuff is, very, very difficult. One of the other banks, Starling, they, uh, they shut down their, their forum because it didn't, didn't work for them. Like, this is really, really difficult to do. And if you're going to be open, you've got to be open all the time. Um, but it's completely worth it. Like, it, what, it, what it caused is that when, when all these banks started to emerge in the UK, um, there are quite a few people who were quite excited and enthusiastic about their existence. And Monzo, because they were open, they kind of acted as like a sponge or a bucket for everyone to put all their enthusiasm into that. So essentially Monzo just captured all of the early adopters and the word of mouth that that kind of created allowed them to kind of grow much, much faster than other startups because all of the excited people who come to conferences like this uh, all had a Monzo card and all told their friends and, you know, like at work, every single person has a Monzo card because it just kind of spreads. So, yeah, it's really difficult to have a proper conversation with your customers, but it, but it does pay off. Okay, so where are we today? So today in the UK, we have the best of both worlds. We have these fantastic startups which are you know, world class in terms of the banking experience. And we have big banks who are a little bit scared and are investing a lot of money in design, design ops, design culture, et cetera. So some of these big banks, they're hiring hundreds of new designers. They're changing the way that they are um, working, you know, huge transformation programs, et cetera. And this is making their apps and their experiences much, much better than they were five years ago. So for customers and for the industry and for people like us, this is absolutely fantastic. So just to close, what have we learned in the last four years? Well, if you take a human-centered approach and if you understand people and their needs and you align your goals, your business goals to their their goals and their needs. And you build better experiences that they'll love. And you have a genuine conversation with your audience. And you give uh, your team the best environment to work in. If you do all these things, okay, then you can change an industry. So what, what we've really learned in the UK in the last four years is that if you do all this stuff, and it's, like a, it's quite a tall order to do all these things, but if you do all this stuff that people like us uh, 
I think, believe in, then it works, right? You can change an industry. And I think if you're the kind of person who comes to a FinTech Design Summit and you're still here at almost six o'clock, that is pretty cool. Thank you very much.